Hello. Welcome, everyone. We are going to start. Thank you. We're starting our session around the world in 80 bytes. I, I will start by saying, actually, anyone who's on the edge of the room and feels like they'd like to come in a little bit closer, please do so. Uh, then we can feel like we're, we're all talking to each other. Um, so you're welcome to, to, to come in close and sit near us if you can. This is Around the World in 80 Bytes. My name is Stefan Hall. I'm the Director of Digital Innovation and Impact at Consumers International, looking after our digital consumer rights portfolio. Um, <clears throat> what, what we do when we access the internet today is we know that our personal data travels through a thicket of regulations uh, across borders. Those are domestic, regional, and sometimes very complicated. Someone described them to me earlier as a spaghetti bowl of, of regulations. And this piecemeal um, nature of the laws is a risk to the global economy because it's a risk to businesses being able to do business. Uh, we are increasingly, increasingly relying on the digital economy uh, as part of our global economy. So any, anything that is a hindrance to that is a risk to the, to the global economy. Because of that, there are more and more calls and louder calls that are asking for reductions in the, the barriers, removal of barriers um, and obstacles for cross-border data flows and an increased focus on improving interoperability between different data governance regimes. Interoperability means, in addition to making the data flow more easily, that the different data systems can connect to each other uh, better. But, there's, there's a but in this, um, that is a risk to consumers. It can be a risk to consumers because the default in many cases could be that we end up with the lowest common denominator for consumer protection and, and consumer rights. So if that happens, will it benefit consumers? If we lower obstacles and lower barriers, how can we do that in a way that benefits consumers? How will it protect their rights? And how can we do it in a way that encourages the dig digital economy to keep growing? And most importantly, are these two questions compatible with each other? Can we have both? Can we have strong consumer rights and protections? And can we encourage global trade, global business, uh, and, and growth in, in digital? That's why we're here today, because we, we want to talk about this issue. But most importantly, I'm delighted to announce that Consumers International is starting a project to explore all of these questions. Um, we will be looking at how consumer rights can and should be embedded into the agreements and practices that govern the transfer of data across borders. And this project is supported by Visa. We're very excited about that. Uh, we're excited to announce its launch and also that Visa, in, in supporting this project, has committed to the Consumers International principles of building with and for consumers. So in other words, Visa has made a commitment to upholding high standards of consumer rights. And we believe that this can be a model for how other businesses uh, work with Consumers International. So I'm delighted uh, to share that with you today. So what do we want to do today? We want all of you to uh, understand the consumer concerns and opportunities related to data flows. We want to provide a bit of understanding around the different uh, data governance regimes the places and spaces where the debates are happening around data transfers. And we also want to provide a bit of evidence of how consumers feel um, about data collection, about data processing and use. Because we think that this is a way to make recommendations that can inform good policy making. So here to help me do this today is Ashley Boyd, the Senior Vice President of Global Advocacy at the Mozilla Foundation. Bob Hedges, Chief Data Officer of Visa, and I'm particularly grateful to Bob for supporting this piece of work. Uh, we've got Mariana Rielli, who's the Director of the Data Privacy Brazil Research Association, and Dr. Melissa Omino, the Director of the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law at Strathmore University. <laughs> Thank you all for being here today. Uh, for those in the room, 
There will be a brief interactive exercise coming up on screen if you want to participate. It's a very short Slido survey, three or four questions that you can answer, which will explore and highlight some of the themes that we'll be talking about today. So I want to start after that very lengthy introduction, so apologies. I want to start with Bob and understand what is the situation today for companies and for consumers. So can you outline, Bob, in simple terms, how does a global company like Visa deal with the transfer of data across borders? And in what ways do those data transfers really impact consumers? Sure, um, thank you, Stefan. And, for, and, and thank you for sponsoring this great event. And, uh, and thank you for inviting me to be on the panel today. Um, just quickly on Visa, uh, most of you will know the company. We're a global payments network. Uh, we serve 4.2 billion consumers around the world. We do business with more than 200 million merchants around the world. Uh, and we do about $14 trillion of annual uh, payments volume uh, between those consumers and those, uh, and those merchants. Um, but to answer your question, there's, there's two things that are driving uh, our keen interest in making sure we get the protocols and processes and consumer rights around how data flows correct. The, the first reason is the one we've all been personally experiencing, and that is every time you make a purchase, the information associated with that purchase may or may not end up being used by some other party to try to sell you something else. And it's our view that uh, to maintain confidence of consumers in the, in, in the commerce system, consumers need to know what's actually happening with their data. And consumers need to have the ability to make decisions about where that data goes. And the practices of today versus the practices of three years ago or five years ago are radically different. And the ability to use computational power and real-time processing and advanced algorithmic techniques are dramatically different. And so like now's the time to put the right protocols and framework in place that keep consumers in charge of themselves. Uh, that's the first reason. The second reason uh, is this phenomenal thing that's not as well known, and that's the explosion of the participation of small businesses in the digital economy. And at Visa, Ourselves from in 2019, we did business uh, facilitating payments for 19 million small businesses globally. Four years later, the number is 65 million small businesses. So the whole small business sector of every economy around the world has gotten engaged in this di digital payment space without the, a level playing field regarding the data they're seeing and their understanding of how they can use it. So, so those are the two driving forces, and it, and it comes out really practically. So the practical problems we, we want to get solved is if you're a merchant selling to a consumer from another country, and you're a small business, and uh, maybe they met you on, a, on their travels, maybe they found you on the internet, their, that small business's ability to capture information about you and turn you into a relationship is actually quite unclear. Because if you live in the UK and you're traveling to Kenya, what rules apply? And does the Kenya business know how to handle it? And, and do the rules in the UK apply to Kenya? Like, how do you, sounds pretty complicated, I'm gonna give up. Or if you're a, uh, a, a business that exports services, you know, products to another country, same problem again with the explosion of small businesses, that the ability to sort of capture data and use it for those small businesses to grow and thrive it's a patchwork of different policies that are inconsistent, and that issue of consistency is what gives participants confidence. We've got to get to a system where there's a consistent approach that empowers consumers and sort of facilitates the continuing growth of small businesses globally in the economy. And I love that we're getting into the, <clears throat> the practical examples of this already, but one of the, uh, you've alluded a bit in your answer there about some of the concerns that, that people in the room might have about, uh, about what you're talking about. So many consumers will be uncomfortable being perceived as just a, a relationship with a business. So tell us, Bob, what, do you, what have you seen, what has Visa seen as some of the main barriers to consumer trust in, in the digital Sure, I mean, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a profound question, but it's like an obvious answer, right? I mean, and, and we, as a company, we've spent a lot of money on consumer research 
uh, interviewed tens of thousands of consumers around the world, and what consumers want are really two things. They want straightforward transparency regarding where the data is actually going, and they want some control over whether it goes there or not. And um, you'd think being able to be straightforward and offer control ought not be a big challenge, uh, but for reasons of history, uh, and we'll let other people uh, talk about the motives of other players, it's not that way. Earlier today, there was a, uh, one of the panels I talked about the, uh, the, the, the dangers of click to consent, where the goal is to get it consented as fast as possible. And we would agree that a little friction is good, and it's not a good experience when on page 14 of the rideshare agreement, are the three sentences that explain what you just agreed to, because no one ever reads those three sentences. And we ought to be able to create a world where the transparency consumers want and the control that they need uh, is made available to them. And the wonderful thing about that is the whole system will benefit, because all the research we've done pretty consistently shows that if you give transparency and control, consumers share more. And, 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 and maybe it's counter conventional wisdom, but we've seen it again and again in all the tests we've done. Consumers share more when you give them more control. And I, I think as a digital commerce ecosystem, we just need to take that leap of faith and act on it for the benefit of all participants. Ashley, you're, you're nodding your head a bit. So tell us, how does that align with what Mozilla uh, knows and it's also its, its vision for, for consumer privacy? Yeah, I was nodding because I actually had written choice and agency, and then Bob said transparency and control, which really feels similar to me. Um, and so um, definitely shared experience with our work at Mozilla in terms of trying to empower and give consumers information about data privacy and what they're looking for. And so we've taken sort of two different approaches. One is we have a project called Privacy Not Included that actually started with internet-connected devices because, you know, you're aware um, when you're doing a financial transaction that you're sharing data with, with the provider and with the business. But um, we know that the explosion of internet connected devices meant that people were sharing data without knowing it because things were in their home and they had no idea. So we took an approach of actually trying to walk the path of reading the whole privacy policy. <laughs> doing the thing that the companies say, well, if you want to know what's going on, you should read this 14-page document. And so we have a whole team that looks at products, reads all of the available documentation that would be available to consumers. We don't do any other research. We don't try to hack in this, um, in this project. And what we found is really shocking that there, you know, in plain sight, um, there's really invasive data collection that we know people aren't comfortable with. And that also just the terminology, the language is not meant to be be um, informative. So the, the, the sort of baseline expectation and experience of consumers as from our experience is very low. And most recently we did, a, actually we did a, a groundbreaking study on privacy in cars because people didn't realize how cars are collecting data about us um, and your passengers. It's not just, it's not just the owners. And um, we actually, unfortunately, it was the worst, um, the worst performing um, set of products that we've ever um, experienced. We, we reviewed 25 cars available for sale in the US and Germany, and they all failed our basic privacy and safety standards, data safety standards, and minimum standards. They're not. This isn't uh, exceptional. This is just sort of the baseline, including things like from a company, Nissan, um, you know, generating um, and, and collecting data about uh, the passenger and, and driver's sexual activity, health behaviors. And, and most shocking is that they didn't say how they were using it or how they were collecting it. So um, that generated a lot of uh, attention because it just showed just what a terrible situation um, is the baseline for consumers right now. Yeah, I've, I've looked at that actually, and I, I thought it was remarkable. I was worried because my car it was actually one of the ones that was not scoring well. And the advice or the recommended advice in the terms and conditions were that I, as the owner of the vehicle, should seek the consent of all my passengers when they, once they get into the That's car, right. that I would be collecting their data on behalf of, of Volkswagen, as it was, which I thought was ridiculous, and also tried doing that with my two-year-old daughter, which uh, she, she wouldn't understand at all, obviously. <laughs> um, 
So, yeah, uh, Melissa, I wanted to ask you what Bob and Ashley have talked about. How is that playing out in the African context? Are you seeing the same types of conversations? Are they different? What is missing from the debate here in, in Africa? Thank you. Thanks so much for that question. Um, I think in order for me to answer that, I have to first start with the statement that Africa is a net data exporter, right? And this is because of, again, the socioeconomic um, realities that are in Africa. So do we have enough data centers to be data importers, right? And do we have computing power, as has been mentioned before? So there is definitely a conversation around cross-border data flows because we are involved in the flow of data. And that's positively outside um, of Africa. And the conversation is multi-tiered. It starts from a continental approach where you'll have the AU and the African Continental Free Trade Agreement talking about um, a digital trade protocol that would touch on cross-border data flows. And that's really looking inward. So Africa to Africa, right? There's that conversation that's going on. And then there are regional conversations which point definitely towards data protection. Um, and that's where privacy sort of enters the chat, um, looking at um, other regulations making sense um, regionally in order to facilitate trade, right? And then there's national conversations. And when you get into national conversations on cross-border data flows, that's when we have the foreign actors really showing up in the form of free trade agreements and negotiation objectives about how data will move um, predominantly outside of Africa. So I think what I'm saying is data is flowing outside of Africa. Um, um, I really like the, the touch points of transparency, the, the touch points of control and choice. And I don't think that that's uh, very much evident um, within the continent. Because if you think about free trade agreements and you think about how they're negotiated, that transparency control goes out the window. But if you look at it on the continental level, at the AU where all, all countries in Africa are sitting at the table to have the conversation, there's a little bit more transparency and more aspects of control. So I go back to the data is flowing, but there's a, a very different conversation about how data flow is flowing within Africa and how data is flowing outside of Africa. And this is sort of a dual question, a follow up to you, Melissa, but also to, to Mariana. What would you like to see done differently within these international frameworks? Wow, <laughs> I have a laundry list. Okay, let me try and uh, narrow it down. I think I would like to see more transparency in how we are talking about the flow of data and the categorization of data. Because when you talk about privacy, um, most legal instruments that talk about privacy really emphasize personal sensitive data, right? And that's health data or, or data that really relates to identification of a person. So I'd like to see that conversation happening more with regards to African data. Africa is not like a, a nice, lovely playing ground to come and collect all the data that you want. And there's no regulation. We do have regulation. There are experts who are investigating and thinking about it. And at CIPIT, we are primarily pushing for a conversation for how to consolidate power amongst African member states to have appropriate conversations with big tech. So that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see um, more of, of what Bob mentioned in terms of transparency. And Mariana, what about the perspective from civil society? What, what's civil society pushing for at the moment? Thank you, uh, Stefan, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so the organization that I represent here um, started out as a data protection organization. So, of course, our concern, especially in Brazil, was uh, passing legislation, comprehensive data protection legislation. And I think that's it's interesting because when you talk about um, uh, cross-border flows of data, the discussions internationally started as uh, focusing on data protection and privacy. And those were like the, the starting points in the, the 80s and the people that were discussing those things were usually privacy experts. And as um, technology the, uh, and globalization and how um, businesses um, started to um, work and to use data in several different ways, this has become a more um, multi-dimensional discussion with um, a lot of different interests that are um, 
of course, not compatible, but also that make it difficult to have like a um, common vocabulary even to discuss, you know, data governance and those uh, issues that are underlying. Uh, and also the arenas where those discussions are happening are different. And so uh, Melissa was just talking about the trade aspect and how those discussions were what that are very, very um, important, uh, not only because of the subject matter, but also because those are um, the types of international norms that can be binding. Those discussions are um, not transparent by their own nature, and civil society is not usually that involved and usually not as knowledgeable and about the technical uh, vocabulary that is uh, involved and also those organizations that are focusing on digital rights and focusing on data protection and the arenas where those discussions are happening are sometimes not really connected with the discussions on trade and digital trade and how those impact each other. So I think um, to answer your question, there's of, of, co of course concern about the impact on consumers and that's also multi-dimensional. It's, it is in, on the individual level and we've talked about about trust, we talked, we've talked about transparency, about knowing what your data is being used for when you're talking about personal data, but there are also the systemic impacts of those discussions uh, on consumers, even if you're not talking about their specific personal data, because that is going to determine how businesses work, what businesses uh, are, have the actual ability to provide products and services because they have the power to use the data. So civil society, of course, is always interested in participating on discussions that it is not a big part of yet. So I think this is, I would say that this is a concern. Uh, to make sure that existing um, uh, protections um, are effective is one, but also to start being a part of conversations that it's not really a part of yet. And tell us a bit about how, how that will work in practice for your organization next year. So in 2024, when Brazil takes over the presidency of, of the G20, what will your organization be doing to get civil society at the table? And what will it be calling for that others here might want to engage on it too? Yeah, spoilers for tomorrow. We have a, a panel on that tomorrow on G20. Um, but yeah, this is really important because as I was uh, mentioning, we have several uh, regulations and frameworks that are um, from the data protection field. You have the discussions on trade, but there has been some consensus that um, multilateral um, uh, and intergovernmental fora like G20 or even uh, G7 are perhaps best suited to um, find some common ground in terms of uh, free flow of data and trust. Um, and so this is, 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 this is an ongoing discussion and how G20 works is that you have to have a sense of continuity between presidencies and with India um, having just um, um, turned uh, over the presidency to Brazil and having had this really impressive work in the discussion about digital public infrastructure, uh, which I think it relates to what Melissa was saying because when we're discussing data, data per se is not that valuable. It is the infrastructure and the analytics uh, that is most important and that leads to discussions on data sovereignty. I'm just, I'm, I'm just bringing a lot of new topics, I guess, but what I want to say is that the expectation is that Brazil will continue on the track that India has um, kind of um, solidified on the discussion of digital, digital, digital public infrastructure, but also bringing some of the more um, uh, regulatory aspects. For example, AI is part of the discussion, is part of the T20 track, which we will be a part of. And so Brazil is kind of trying to mix, I guess, some of the um, India uh, legacy with um, some things that are really important for us, such as disinformation and platform regulation. So yeah, I guess we'll see. <laughs> yeah. So we've we've talked a bit about the situation as it is. Um, so do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I just I. It's interesting to reflect on the fact that that everyone has really talked about 
some of the risks on the extractive nature from the personal to the, the sort of the cross border. And I was just thinking about this kind of this concept that when people know more and they actually have more clarity about how their information, either personal or their collective information is being used, that they actually have more buy-in and they're more invested in the outcome. And so it just, it feels like when we're talking about it on a bigger level um, in terms of data flows, it just really reinforces to me the importance of at an individual transactional level, because I think a lot about that individual consumer experience, providing more information gets people more invested in the outcome. And part of what Mozilla Foundation's been investing in is, uh, is creating experiments where people are creating their own data ecosystem, where they're collecting data from their community for their community's use and having that sovereignty over their data. And they're really invested in the outcome. They know how it's going to be used. Those are small experiments, but they can really be, um, I think, created at a larger scale to address some of the disconnect between what people are experiencing this on an individual level and how it's taking shape transnationally. Yeah, so th I think that's interesting because um, th there's different, there's a sort of dual discussion here around participation in data flows. There's the involvement of civil society and participating in the, the, the high level nature of it. And then there's the kind of bottom up participation that you're talking about involving individual consumers in yeah, more control and collection over their data. Um, like Bob, Visa operates all over the world. You've you've got a you know enormous and powerful corporate machine. Um, do you see those things as being reconcilable? Can can consumers have more control over their data, and is it also possible for them to be better represented in uh, in these kind of global agreements as well? Um, I, I think we, 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 we need to enable consumers having more control because uh, consumers' confidence in the system is dependent on them having that control. Uh, it has been brought up about the, the arc of the last decade around data privacy regulation, right? And if you go back in time, it was about protection and it was often around principles. And even in, in GDPR, it wasn't really clear until this past January with the European court rulings around the need for consent to allow the inference modeling that we had the first concrete example of what GDPR's consent uh, interpretations properly were. And so the, the point is that over the arc of the last 10 years, it's the, the whole discussion's become more granular and concrete because it's the actions of consumers that we're trying to protect and support. And it's interesting because if you followed the, uh, the recently passed uh, Indici, India privacy regulation, uh, it's the first time in a, a, a major country where they've laid out very explicit consent obligations that really match what consumers expect. And, and, and I think you know, that law could well provide models to others because of the specificity with which they've tried to um, define uh, what do we need to do to empower consumers and what do we need to do to allow them to have the control and transparency that they want. And you know, hopefully, like in the, in the data free flow for, with trust program that G7 and G20 uh, uh, started a couple of years ago, uh, there's a lot of discussion there about consent, and hopefully when it comes to uh, Brazil, we'll extend that and, 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 and really get build out the operating model we need that builds that bridge between uh, the, the high-level principle discussion and what will help a consumer be more confident, which will lead to small businesses growing. And I think you're right that the, the conversation has become a lot more granular and specific in recent years. Um, Melissa, that also opens up a p the potential that uh, there's more sort of litigation around very specific terms in agreements. How can consumers use that to their advantage? How can people in the room make sure that the granular and specific conversation is, is not losing sight of the overall goal, which is more, more transparency, more control, uh, more agency for individuals. 
Okay, that's a really difficult question to answer. Um, but maybe the best way to answer a difficult question is to give an example, right? So I think a, a great example about the conversation we're having is what happened with WorldCoin um, in, in Kenya. So that was a mixture of emerging tech. Um, there was an issue of the collection of sensitive personal data being people's irises. There's the inclusion of um, a new business practice, um, which was cryptocurrency, and then uh, everything broke loose, right? So in that, in that situation, I think it, it showed us that um, you can have a regulator involved, and usually when you think about data, um, it's the data regulator that is involved. And in Kenya, the data regulator did step in and was involved in that process in terms of licensing, um, in terms of trying to figure out um, the, the issues around consent, because that was a big issue. Now, the regulator, you, what I'm trying to say is you can have all the possible laws in place, because I think the Data Protection Act in Kenya is a really good law. It has regulations. They're coming up with guidelines. We have a data protection officer and, and several commissioners. But that wasn't enough to sort of tackle that world coin situation. And that points out the, the issues, especially in the African context that come up, um, was the regulator properly um, prepared to deal with this sort of emerging tech? And were consumers prepared to deal with um, sort of a challenge to what consent means? The challenge there was that there was a monetary incentive to actually participate in the WorldCoin data collection exercise. And that leads to a very academic question as to when there's a monetary incentive, is, is there really consent in that, in that situation? And then we then saw wonderfully how parliament stepped in to sort of have a conversation with the regulator and to stop this data collection activities. And for me, that's a win. That's a win because we see that we have processes and we have regulations that can be utilized. We also get to see areas where there are gaps that we can fit into. But I also think it, it raises um, a wonderful field for consumer advocates to step in. Because in that, in that scenario, if the consumer advocates had stepped in before the parliamentary hearings, before the recommendations by parliament, while WorldCoin was going around collecting um, irises, then I think there, there would have been a bigger impact to understanding consent um, for the consumers on the ground. So um, I hope that example is answering your question. <laughs> So you, you, you think that be, from the, the movement sort of went from a, taking a negative and turning it into a positive because it was, it was able to use what happened to its advantage? Yes, I think that we are still at the, at the crux of this scenario, right? Because it hap the, the parliamentary hearings happened this year, a few months ago. The recommendations from the parliamentary hearing are very interesting. The, there's a call for um, an oversight body, for example. Uh, I don't know if that's a positive or a negative. We can speak about that off the record. But I think it does highlight that we have processes that can work. We have regulations that can work. And we can hold people accountable, right? And it's also pushing the idea of transparency because WorldCoin says it was transparent, but then we have questions of how transparent are you when you are sort of pushing consent with a monetary incentive? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in about the real possibilities and exciting um, you know, future of more um, advocacy and grassroots action around sort of challenging the norms. And I was just sitting here thinking, you know, it's, it's hard to remember that I feel like just a, a short few years ago, we were sort of in a totally different place about not being clear that people cared about privacy. <laughs> and it, it's easy to kind of jump over and think like, okay, well, how are we dealing with consent? And it's just, you know, I think that we're in a mode now of we know that people care about privacy. You know, a recent Ipsos global study found that, you know, two thirds of people didn't know what data was being collected about them and where it went. So we have, you know, concern, but um, awareness, which is really, really important. And so now we're moving into a stage of how to mobilize that concern. Where are the 
vectors of change? How can we get people feeling like they have the agency, even if they're not experiencing it in their day-to-day -day lives? Um, and then I think we're kind of on the cusp of a different um, sort of third phase, which I'm excited about as well, which is challenging the norms that we've become accustomed to. And I think the more radical approaches to why are is data being collected about us um, against, you know, without our buy-in about how it's being used and for what purpose. And that kind of goes to the more of the data sovereignty question. So I think that it's really important that as consumer advocates, we give people a sense um, and really create, help create pathways for people to challenge what's happening um, and support in terms of connecting that to laws. Um, and then also, I'm really excited about Visa's work because part of our approach at Mozilla is to really incentivize businesses to try a different way. And you know, we'll see, we won't know whether a new way is successful until someone tries, right? And so um, you know, the data would suggest that um, consumers will really respond to data protecting products and services. Um, and that's really, I think, a significant milestone that we have to hit. Uh, just building on Ashley's point a little bit, and um, you know, we're and, and the whole idea of pathways, you know, providing pathways. Uh, it, maybe we're also at an inflection point that, uh, as a ecosystem, we 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 will no longer gather and talk about what the consumers are telling us because the the the, the findings are abundantly clear, right? You know, only seven percent of consumers in all the work we've done say they understand the policies. Two thirds of consumers say the policies are written to the advantage of businesses. The most shocking thing to me is two thirds of consumers think companies routinely violate the, 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 their own policies in using the data. And so that's what consumers are saying about the system, right? So looking for pathways, one of the things we have going on at Visa, we're sponsoring a project with uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology where we are uh, building the protocols to trace where data goes. So essentially, you know, watermarking your data so that if you agree with your bank or agree with a third party, they can have the data for a certain purpose and they share it with somebody else or send it someplace else, you'll be able to trace that and hold the party accountable for violating their agreement with you. And if we take this system that today is totally opaque and make it transparent. It'll change the whole conversation. So we're investing in the project. We're about to publish the protocols. We're standing up a sandbox where we'll be able to uh, have uh, partner companies move data through the sandbox and see if it can be appropriately traced. And I think the more we invest in strengthening the consumer's ability to make the system work for them, the more the system's gonna thrive. And, that, and, that, and, and, I, and, and technology could well be part of the answer here as opposed to assuming technology's working against us all the time. We can harness technology to make the system work better for consumers. I just um, want to make a quick remark on the question about reconciling or bridging the high level and the grassroots um, approaches, we were, we're still trying to bridge the high levels. Uh, and and I, I think that is really important. And it was my previous point about civil society or civil societies having, um, um, being able to participate in those processes, but not necessarily to reach like harmonization. Uh, I, I'm not sure that is uh, uh, possible like in perfect harmonization, but uh, to leave space for, um, for policy uh, interventions, policy space for countries, uh, but also for uh, within countries, for communities, for consumers uh, to exercise not only their rights, but also uh, their creativity in terms of developing new frameworks. So I think those things connect in the sense that civil society needs to uh, be a part of the discussion because some of those high level attempts at harmonization can hinder, can restrict uh, policy space, can restrict countries' abilities uh, to regulate, and we have some concrete examples of that with um, uh, the discussion on, on, on source code and, um, 
algorithm accountability that is very concrete for consumers. If um, a country cannot require companies to disclose certain uh, aspects of their uh, systems that can be harmful, uh, um, so those things have like a relationship that is very uh, intricate. But I think those things connect in the sense that you have to have some level of, of harmonization, but also leave space uh, for uh, consumer advocacy uh, at the national level and also for experimentation, like um, Ashley just mentioned in terms of data commons, data, you know, all of those other frameworks for data governance that are being discussed. So, so um, I, I really like that we, we started the conversation, I won't say negatively, but we were concerned and now everyone is feeling a, or expressing a bit more optimism about, about the future, which is perfect to go into questions. Um, just before we open the floor, I will ask the panel to think about your closing remarks and tell us what would you like to see happening next? So what would be, what do you want to, to happen next in each of your domains? Um, think about that and then we'll, uh, we'll ask the audience to ask a few questions we've got about. 10, 15 minutes of questions. If you are asking a question, please tell us who you are. Um, and we've got a couple of mics going around somewhere. One there, yeah. Hello, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. That was really interesting. My name is Leo Frey. I'm working for the European Consumer Organization. And I was really interested by the remarks some of you made about trade discussions, because this is something that we're actually quite concerned about also uh, in Europe and the, the policy space that it represents. So the risk of some close in trade agreements on data flows and on source code, as you mentioned, that can actually limit the ability of governments to regulate on data protection, privacy, accountability of AI. Um, and now we're seeing, for instance, that there is a big negotiation in the World Trade Organization with 96 countries involved, and where such clauses could be involved. Uh, and we're also seeing that the United States are now saying that they are making kind of a pause to reflect about what this means for their policy space, and they are quite concerned, and so they might no longer uh, adhere to such clauses. So I was wondering what you think, and I was also wondering if you think that us, as an international consumer movement, we should step in this discussion. Thank you. Lots of questions in there. Um, I'll, I think I'll ask Melissa to, to respond on that, and we can already queue up the next question um, while, while she's speaking. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, yes, so free trade agreements will always come into play when you're talking about cross-border data flows because data flows in order to facilitate trade. Um, it's interesting you talk about the negotiation of that and the, the recent change in the U.S. position. I can tell you in the context of Kenya, there is uh, currently being negotiated the U.S.-Kenya Strategic Trade Investment Partnership. And as... As was mentioned, it's really hard to get information about what is being negotiated. We were lucky we got negotiation objectives, I think, about two years ago. And the objectives were really specific and precise from the US side. They did uh, expressly mention cross-border data flows. They wanted to have positive cross-border data flows. They were against data localization. And they also mentioned issues around source code, um, you know, black boxing of source code or algorithms, right? And it aligns a lot with where, how the US trades. The Kenyan objectives were vastly different. <laughs> they talk about uh, technology transfer, knowledge exchange, and help in development. And my question would be, now that the US has sort of changed tact, and we know that there's um, other negotiations on the international field around these areas, would that then directly mean a change in what will be negotiated in the US-Kenya STIP? I do not know, because I don't know. There's no transparency <laughs> in that situation. And you'd find that maybe, there's also a question around power, right? Um, if you are collective, then you have more bargaining power and you can sort of um, ask for things that align with you or make a fair, let me say that. But if you are 
a, a developing country versus a developed country and you are a net data exporter. I don't know how much power you have in negotiating for these things and for pushing for, for example, issues like data localization, which have aspects of privacy attached to it. And maybe that's what I'm trying to say. In the, in the trade space, we need to have more conversations around privacy and more conversations about um, protection of consumers. I don't think that is at the forefront of the agenda in those spaces. So that answers your next question. Um, do you have a, a place to play? Yes, you have um, a role to play there. You have a role to play in terms of um, helping the membership uh, the consumer advocates who are your members, empowering them to be able to have these conversations with trade negotiators, um, just basic understanding, and also so that they can ask the right questions and know the landscape. Yeah, thank you. And that might be something that, that you talk about again at the end when you say, what, what, what do you want to see next? I suspect you, you might be bringing up some of those themes again. Um, who has the mic now? I have the microphone. I have the microphone, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Felicia Monye, I'm professor of law, University of Nigeria, president, consumer awareness organization. Uh, thank you for the insightful uh, discussions. But uh, what I want to ask, in the area of negotiation, is there anyone or are there some people that represents the interests of consumers. Because when you, when, when you talk about uh, data privacy, you know, when you look at the factual situation, you see that consumers don't have any, right, any power to control what is done by business men. First, because of the power imbalance. Then standard, uh, standard form, the use of standard form. You, 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 you have to, you are given a form to fill as a consumer, and you are required to fill certain things, you know, to give information. And uh, some of the numbers are marked asterisk and say required. That means you must fill those ones. If, so it's a case of take it or leave it. You must act the way they want you to act. So when it comes to uh, data, uh, privacy, I see two things that will help consumers. First, strong regulation. Strong regulation. Then, effective consumer redress. Mm -hmm. Then, at the level of negotiation, there should be experts negotiating on behalf of consumers. Because once they are given a form to fill, or they are given any contract, they don't have any choice. You just have to take it because most of these contracts come in in the form of standard form contracts. So if, if, even just buying your airline ticket, you just have to take it the way it is. Filling the uh, Wi-Fi uh, uh, form yesterday, they said terms and conditions uh, apply. So you must click on that. You must accept. If you don't accept, you, you, you won't go further. So, and another thing that negotiators should also look at is this incorporation by reference. A lot of terms are incorporated by reference. You don't even see the terms stated, or you just see a reference to those forms, to those terms and references. Even in advert, they say terms and conditions that apply. See, consumers are just overwhelmed with a lot of conditions, so please, there should be people negotiating on behalf of consumers. And there should be strong regulation and effective consumer redress. Thank you. Yeah, I think that there's also a point in there about who, who benefits from the regulation because uh, you know, an organization like Visa is m more able to comply with complicated legislation and regulation than a small business, a startup. Um, Bob, what's your experience well, of that? Well, I want to. I want to agree with. I want to agree with the comment and the examples, right? And 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 make it a uh, for a moment just a a, a regulation neutral uh, uh, observation. I mean, it's it's offensive when you have when when agreeing to the terms of sharing data is a condition 
of doing business with a party, your, your Wi-Fi sign-up example or ride-sharing agreements. And I think it, it's clear consumers don't want that world, and there's a big commercial opportunity to define a world where it's much more explicit for con to, to the consumer. Like, rather than a 14-page agreement where it's all buried, you say, we want this date element for this length of time, we're gonna give it to this party for this purpose. And, it, and, and make the law that le make the law about being that transparent about the data, uh, you know, being collected and how the data is being used. And I think there's a, a big opportunity to to have that type of clarity. And 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 there's examples of companies that have moved in that direction, uh, and consumers benefit, and the the whole you know society benefits from doing it. And if you if you look at where the arc of all this is going, that's where it's going, and I think the sooner we rally to get there, the better off everyone's gonna be. Do you wanna come in on that? No. Okay. I think we've got time for a couple more questions, so we'll go over here and then at the back, and then we'll come back to the panel with that last question. Hi, I'm Rafe Mazur with Fair Finance Consulting. Uh, questions for Mariana and Bob. Mariana, I'm just wondering, have you, do you think there are any lessons, um, this is more domestic, but in terms of um, data flows from the rollout of Open Finance Brazil, because that's moving an incredible amount of consumer data. And then for Bob, with the US CFPB now, issuing draft rules to create open finance in the US, do you think this watermarking solution could be used by regulators in that type of situation? Hi, sorry, can you just repeat the last part of your question to me? What in Brazil exactly? In the um, open finance, uh, it, what lessons you've learned so far around um, data security and protecting consumers' data flows? Yeah. That's a really good question and timely because we were <clears throat> talking about the G20 discussion and the, the discussion on uh, uh, digital uh, public infrastructure and there is a, a big discussion going on now about PICS. It's a, you know, PICS. <laughs> uh, it is a success story because it is um, very new, like two years, I think it has been um, active and most of the Brazilian population is already uh, using that and um, it is so there are two sides I think of the discussion on the one hand um, there is the infrastructure uh, level and uh, the trust level of Brazilians uh, on this specific system this national uh, payment system uh, on the other hand um, the, 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 I think the complexity of the discussion on data sovereignty, starting with the fact that it doesn't mean the same thing for everyone who uses the term. It means like different things for, for different uh, people and groups. But it is that um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, is, it, it will be better for the individual consumer in terms of uh, their trust in the system. So we also have a lot of issues with uh, breaches of uh, security uh, uh, in terms of both in terms of like data protection, like um, personal data leaks, but also um, scams are very prevalent, and the system does um, can make it easier for vulnerable, already vulnerable uh, people and populations to be the victims of uh, scams. So you have to take all of that into account and to have those discussions in, in the very concrete sense, looking at what populations you are dealing with. So Brazil has its very specific um, characteristics, uh, and but there are other countries that ha share similar characteristics and challenges, and this is one of the ways what we are approaching is it to have those discussions uh, with those countries, because it is a starting point to understand how to um, focus on having own infrastructures and having uh, systems that um, 
that are um, good for the country as a whole, but also take into account those very specific characteristics. So I think this, is, I wouldn't say it's a lesson learned because it's still very new, but this is one of the discussions that is happening between Brazil and India because India already has its extensive experience with uh, national uh, payment systems and financial uh, services. So PICS is one of the things we've been discuss discussing. In uh, is the second part of your question, if I followed you right, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at how data privacy regulations has evolved over the last uh, uh, 10 years, 15 years, uh, there's always a market that all of a sudden is where the, uh, you know, the, the, the workshop or the next evolution of the, of the, the rules are being worked out, right? And uh, it was Brussels to London, uh, London to Canberra, uh, you know, Canberra to Davos, it's, it's moved around the world over time. And uh, I, I mentioned most recently the, the, the India data privacy regulations, which are quite, quite progressive and informative and potentially instructive. In the United States right now, there's rules being uh, promulgated under the Financial Services Reform Act, the Dodd-Frank Law, Rule 1033, which has to do with the conditions under which uh, banks must allow third parties to get access to the data of consumers. And in that proposed rulemaking, there's very explicit consent requirements are being written, written into it. And uh, I think that is heartening because it's showing this progressive move to giving more empowerment to consumers and making it law, not making it uh, uh, you know, optional, not making it a brand choice, not make, but making it law. And I, and you know, the United States historically has not been at the forefront of policy in this area, but specifically around consent embedded in Rule 1033 as part of Dodd Frank. Uh, there it is, right? And so I think, you know, your earlier question, uh, Stefan, like, like the more this becomes a global conversation about empowering consumers, uh, the more we're going to make dramatic progress for the overall ecosystem. And it's a neighborhood at a time, and each neighborhood makes a little bit of progress. Um, and and um, hopefully the, the U.S. will continue to make progress on this front as well. Okay, so we'll do the last two questions. There's one here, and then there's, there was a lady uh, towards the back. Hi, uh, thank you for the panel. My name is Isabella Fernandez. I'm the executive director of the TOR project. We are a nonprofit that builds uh, tools to free open source tools to protect people's privacy. And uh, I want to bring this perspective because while regulations are being discussed or even uh, struggling to be implemented, we give agency to consumers to protect the privacy and have control over the data. I also uh, want to bring the perspective of uh, because when you connect through Tor, nobody knows where you're coming from, and this also helps uh, protect consumers from being discriminated because of their location, right? Being uh, given different prices because of their location. So that is also that uh, issue related to your data and how uh, consumers that is being used to discriminate them. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's been quite enlightening on some of the conversations going on. And I keep hearing um, barriers to consumers' trust, this transparency, and also the need for consumers to control. But then I didn't hear anything about security, data security, because that is um, tremendously important. Um, like they said, who, you, 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 there's no option to opt out. Now, I'm afraid of my security, my data, but I still don't have an option and I have a need for your product. And so I think if there is a way for part of the regulation to really build in some form of uh, compliance that is based on you break it, you pay. I think from the, the business side, they'll be more serious about our data sovereignty, about our sec data security. And I heard we have this data 
net data, we, we don't really, but we do, it gives, we're empowered because they need our information. And if we come from that perspective that the so-called developing countries, you are import, uh, importing your products into these economies. And so you need data in order to know exactly what is needed. And that is, an, um, I feel empowered that if I, I force you to pay for it, either from a perspective of redress or security or transparency, you'll be more, you'll be quite serious. And, and so I look at it as us building our framework and, in, and, and holding on to the narrative that you need us as much as we need you. And once you can see it from that perspective, it makes it much easier to sit at a table and, and say, yes, we are kind of equal, because if you don't have us, you're, you can only grow so much. And we know where the majority of the population is, is now in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And so it is extremely important you sit at the table with us as equals and say, okay, these are some of our, your challenges. These are also some of our challenges. How do we come together to address it? Is there going to be, with AI and everything else happening, uh, the other day I'm trying to sign up. My sister was signing up on Spotify. Next thing I look on my phone, I'm connected to her Spotify account. And I just sat down baffled and I, I finally figured it out. It was from the internet connection. I never gave access to Spotify, but it's on my phone with her login information. You know? And so I'm sitting down there and I, I have to uninstall, and when I installed it back, it was still back on because of the internet connection. And so we have to get to that place of, of saying, I almost wrote to Spotify because I was so frustrated, that you, you can't take control based on the interconnectivity that the network provides for us. And so I realized it's a whole bunch, there's a whole slew of people that I have to write to. <laughs> it's not just Spotify, it's a networking company. It's Samsung, um, it's a G Gmail that all of them need to be written to. Thank you. Thank you for that. You might see, if you're in the scam session tomorrow morning, you might hear more about digital security there. So I would encourage you to, to be there. I was uh, just going to jump in and just say that um, part of our Privacy Not Included um, project where we look at specific pr um, products um, and their policies, uh, we do actually look at a security component and a privacy component. And your experience is exactly right in the sense of no company or product we've reviewed that's bad on security is great on privacy, right? So it, it, it is the foundational element. And, you know, that we have the two um, components because they, they have different um, policies and, and practices. But that really is the foundation um, from which we build. And so I think that it's interesting, just your comment made me think about how we neglect that at our peril because that's where a lot of um, our core experience is. And so what is the hierarchy of we want things to be secure, we want choice, and those really build on each other. And so thank you for that. We're a little bit over time. I think we've got just a few minutes to go back to the panel with, with that last question. What I'll say before then is that there are obviously more questions and there's more to be talked about here. Tomorrow evening after the end of the program at 5.40 p.m., Visa will actually be uh, hosting a side event upstairs in the Mount Kenya Room 3. And I think, Bob, you're presenting uh, some of the research around consumer privacy that Visa has done. So there's more discussion to be had. And uh, apart from here in the corridors, tomorrow the side event at 5.40 uh, in Mount Kenya Room 3 is another place to do that. So with the closing question, I'll start with uh, Melissa and work back towards me as briefly as you can, if it's possible, what would you like to see happen next? I think I'm already seeing it happening, which is the conversation that we're having here today um, with the 
with different stakeholders having this conversation. I think that's the first step, so I'm glad to see that happening. Specific to Africa, I think that we need to continue the regional efforts that have been started at the AU. There's the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement agreement digital trade protocol that is uh, under negotiation about to be finalized. I'd really like to see that implemented, right? Because we can have wonderful policies, but we need to implement them. So if we implement them and we do that um, as a continent or membership of the continent, then I think we are getting one step closer to ensuring that we are protecting consumers' rights. I think I'm um, sticking with the idea of um, bridges because this is some of the work that we've been doing. So even um, within like specific civil society groups that are working on data protection, advocacy for 15 years, 20 years, there is um, there is no uh, common ground in terms of um, understanding uh, the impacts and the multi-dimensional impacts of data. And it, it, this is not to say that there needs to be or that there will be this idea of a global data governance that covers everything. I'm, this is more personal. I'm a bit weary of the idea. I think it is good that we don't speak the same languages uh, all the time. But there needs to be like some common ground so that the specific uh, lived experiences of countries and of peoples inside those countries can exist and uh, so that this, those impacts are shared in a more equitable way. So our work is to kind of build those bridges and share knowledge. And I would hope that spaces like these um, keep happening so that those bridges can be effecti effectively built. Thank you. I think the opportunity is to um, keep the conversation really concrete. You know, the, the examples of, you know, that have been used in, in, uh, in, the, in today's discussion that are of individuals as consumers where something happens in the purchase process or the sign-up process or they get surveillance tracked or they're their child gets surveillance tracked and then they use the laptop and get the, get the mark. The, those are really specific concrete things that through technology and, uh, and regulation don't have to happen to people. And, 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 and if we're concrete, we can create a, a, a much better world around how our data is shared and used that empowers consumers. And, but I think the trick is, and, and, and we at Visa are very committed to, is making it a really concrete conversation. What is the, how does the consent standard have to work? What does the technology need to do? How do you spread and make really accessible privacy and anti-tracking tools so can, this does not have to come to consumers? Because what's there's many things that are, are, are uh, uh, inequitably distributed. One is knowledge on how to solve these problems. And I think if we focus on broadening the amount of people that can solve these problems and empower consumers, uh, we can make lots of progress. And But it's going to be through being really concrete about the practices that need to be promoted and adopted. I would say um, let's get where we're going faster. <laughs> I think we're going to look back and just marvel that we like lived under this these conditions related to data. It's just it's it's shocking, um, and so I think you know really as we look to strengthen and and really solidify um, regulation, harmonize it across geographies. Um, I I really think that consumers should and and can pressure companies to leap out in front of regulation. We, they don't. We don't have to um, wait for regulation to come. We can build products that are um, to our liking that, you know, for example, do not give us the binary that we don't like, do give us that transparency. And I think when we see real choice, we're going to see people, um, consumers flocking to those choices and it's going to be a race to the top. So I see that potential very clearly. I just, my hope is that we get there faster because that's what people want and it's what's right. Thank you. You've, you've all summarized it so much better than I could, which is keep doing what we're doing, get more specific, intensify efforts, and obviously keep working with each other. As an obvious next step, 
Uh, our colleague Javier uh, Ruiz is at the front here. He is actually leading the project that will be as concrete as possible in building consumer redress and privacy into these cross-border uh, data flows. So if you're interested in, in working on that with us and with Visa, talk to Javier. Thank you so much to everyone on the panel. Your insights have been invaluable and I think connect so well to many of the other themes that we're, we're talking about over the next couple of days. Thank you all for making the trip to Kenya and, and for coming uh, locally too. Uh, and yeah, please give a hand to, to the panel.